Well, good afternoon or good morning, everybody, depending on what time zone you're um, calling in from. Um, it is my distinct pleasure to uh, introduce my friend and my colleague, um, Lipika Goyle today. Um, Dr. Goyle is a faculty member at Massachusetts General Hospital, so one of the faculty members at Harvard Medical School. Um, and she has really been on the forefront of defining both the use um, and the challenges of FGFR um, inhibitors for our cholangiocarcinoma patients. Um, this includes seminal discoveries um, regarding how resistance develops for these agents um, and discovering and uncovering um, new options for these patients past the now um, very excitingly approved multiple FDA uh, approved agents for uh, FGFR fusion patients. Um, and so today I think we're really looking forward to hearing about the wisdom that she's gained from years of working in this space. Um, and she's gonna talk to us um, even more so about what's coming because um, there's a lot more on the horizon for what we may be able to do for these patients. So thank you very much in advance, Dr. Goyle and welcome. Thank you very much, Nilo. It's really my pleasure to be here today to talk to everyone about this topic. I'm going to share my slides. So as Milo mentioned, I'll be mentioned, I'll be talking about next steps in FGFR in cholangiocarcinoma. And it's really been through the ICRN and through the Cholangiocarcinoma Foundation that we've been able to learn a lot about FGFR and help develop this class of drugs. And so I'm excited to talk about some of the collaborations that have been facilitated by this group. And anything that I talk about, we really welcome additional collaborators. So please reach out to me anytime afterwards if you want to participate in any of these projects or if you have any ideas or feedback of things you're seeing in your own research. We'd love to chat and have a conversation. So just to put things in context a little bit, you know, what is it like to build a translational research program in cholangiocarcinoma? So first of all, it's a really uncommon cancer, as we've talked about. Um, certainly, we know that there are a lot more patients in the United States and internationally than previously was recognized. So there's more than um, we initially thought. But still, compared to breast cancer, where there's more than 200,000 cases per year in the US, lung cancer, again, more than 200,000 cases per year, um, colon and rectal cancer, more than 150,000 cases per year, you can see with cholangiocarcinoma, there are about 8,000 cases per year. So what does that mean? It really means that it's so important for all of us to work together and collaborate because when you have a less common cancer, um, you know, the clinical trials require a lot of coordinated effort to bring patients on to trials, to be able to have a critical mass, to be able to find whether or not drugs work or not. And then also when you wanna understand what is the biology of tumors, you want to be able to um, put all your data together across multiple institutions, because maybe each of us have five, 10, 30 patients with a particular um, issue, and we wanna bring it all together. So we'll talk about how some of those collaborations have occurred across many institutions, both in the US and Europe, and we're certainly looking for collaborators in Asia as well. Um, why is it so important? I mean, these are what the stats are for cholangiocarcinoma, as anyone who's joining this webinar probably already knows. The five-year survival of cholangiocarcinoma is about 10%, and the five-year survival for people with advanced cholangiocarcinoma is about 2%. So um, really looking for ways to um, improve these numbers, and it's really by working together that we're going to be able to do that. The other thing is when the survival is so short, we really need to make sure that we get it right with clinical trials first time around, second time around, because a lot of patients, they make it to plan A, but some people don't make it to plan B because it's a pretty aggressive tumor. So everything that we can learn to identify biomarkers about what's going to work right off the bat, we really want to be able to do smart trials so that we're not wasting patients' time, giving them drugs that only cause toxicity and don't in the end really benefit them that much. So really doing a lot of biomarker work to understand primary resistance, acquired resistance, so important for um, helping patients. So again, anyone joining this webinar probably already knows a lot about cholangiocarcinoma, but just so that we anchor the conversation around some basics, cholangiocarcinoma is an aggressive malignancy of the bile ducts. There's different types, intrahepatic, extrahepatic, and then also there's gallbladder cancer, which is one of the biliary tract cancers. 
the incidence of intrahepatic carcinoma is rising both in the US and globally. As much as possible, when patients present early enough, we try to offer surgery and um, it has the highest chance of cure of any of our modalities. But unfortunately, the recurrence rates are high and majority of patients present with advanced disease because um, you know, the liver is not a place where a lot of people end up having symptoms initially. The standard treatments right now are gemcitabine cisplatin in the first line, full fox in the second line for people that don't have um, other alterations. But this landscape is quickly expanding and one class of drugs that's really exciting is the FGFR inhibitors. So why has there been such an explosion in intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma of pharmaceutical interest and interest from the part of scientists, oncologists, and really different communities in oncology? A big part of it is that there are targets that we can um, design drugs for. And so nearly 40 to 50% of patients with intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma have some sort of actionable target. targets. This is a nice review that was done by Angela Lamarca and Juan Valle and colleagues. And you can see the relative percentages of different alterations. And you can see a big fat circle for FGFR2 because this is a relatively frequent alteration, FGFR2 fusions and mutations, and also sometimes amplifications. It's a relatively frequent alteration in intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. So one of the most important things in doing research is being able to collaborate with our scientists. I have the distinct pleasure and uh, opportunity to participate with a lot of projects with Nabil Bardisi, who's one of our world leaders in cholangiocarcinoma model systems and in, um, cholangiocarcinoma biology. And together, we've been able to look at different stories to understand biology and FGFR. And also something I'll talk about towards the end is potentially design a next generation trial that could help patients. So a lot of what we do in clinic is when patients go for a resection or go for biopsy, we send a piece of this to Dr. Bardisi's lab. His team implants it, and they create these patient-derived xenografts, and they can also develop cell lines. And it's really these models that we're doing a lot of the biology uh, testing in and then also drug testing in. And there have been a series of labs across the world that have been working on cholangiocarcinoma. There have been a lot of high-impact papers with people using models. And for a long time, we were throwing spaghetti against a wall and seeing what sticks and using drugs that are being used in pancreas cancer and HCC. But now with all these model systems and really having good collaboration between the clinic and the bench, we've been able to do smarter trials that help patients. So I'll first talk about the FGFR pathway and the current landscape of inhibitors. Then I'll talk about what's leading to drug failure and then some trials that can potentially overcome some of these causes of drug failure. So on the FGFR pathway, as many people know, FGFR is a receptor tyrosine kinase, or four of them, one through four. And there's a family of different ligands, um, 18 or more different ligands for these receptors. And FGFR really plays a crucial role in physiology, just normal physiology, in cell proliferation, survival, and migration. So cancer cells like to hijack, uh, you know, pathways that are part of normal physiology. It's not surprising that they do that. And what we have found is that activation of the FGFR pathway certainly leads to oncogenesis um, in a variety of different cancers. And so you often see ligand independent unregulated activation of the MAP kinase pathway, the PI3 AKT pathway, P3 kinase AKT pathway, and also the JAK stat pathway. And then, as I mentioned, there are a series of different alterations including FGFR2 fusions, mutations, and amplifications. What we have seen is that fusions so far have the most sensitivity to the FGFR inhibitors, and those are seen in about 13 to 14% of patients. There's some really elegant work that I'll mention by James Cleary and colleagues, the Dana Farber, um, looking at a specific kind of mutation. Um, it's a insertion deletion um, at, uh, in the extracellular domain of FGFR and some work on that about the sensitivity to FGFR inhibitors. And then also rarely with FGFR amplifications, you sometimes see responses as well. So a series of different alterations. So this is the landscape of what we've been working with in cholangiocarcinoma for many years. Since 2009, gemcitabine cisplatin was the only kit on the block for many years. And that was what we had in the first line. And then Standing on the shoulders of giants, our patients were able to benefit from the tissue agnostic approvals for pembrolizumab 
in patients with MSI high advanced solid tumors. That's seen in about 2% of patients with plantar carcinoma. And then also the different NTRAC inhibitors were um, approved for patients with NTRAC fusion positive advanced solid tumors. And that's probably about less than 1% of patients with plantar carcinoma. And then in 2019, Fulfox became the standard. And then really big news in 2020 and 2021, we had two FDA approvals, the first FDA approvals ever in plantar carcinoma, both pemigatinib and infragratinib, second generation ATP competitive FGFR inhibitors gained accelerated FDA approval. So let's talk about these drugs and the data for them. So pemigatinib, again, is a second generation ATP competitive FGFR inhibitor. And in the FIGHT-202 study in cohort A, which included patients with FGFR2 fusions and rearrangements, we can see the waterfall plot here with a beautiful response rate of 35.5% and a disease control rate of 82.2%. One thing I want to call your attention to is what we'll see in the next three waterfall plots, one is for pemigatinib, one is for infragratinib, and the other one is for fudibatinib, is that among the patients who had partial responses, which are in purple here, you also see some patients with stable disease, that's in green here, and with progressive disease, that's in orange here. And that's happening because people have a response, but then they lose it by the next scan. So it's a short-lived response, and it's not a confirmed response, so that's considered stable disease or they have a partial response because they have significant tumor shrinkage of some lesions, but they develop a new lesion, for example, and that's considered progressive disease. So that's part of the, that's part of the conversation around why drugs fail, and we'll talk about that going forward. So here with infragratinib, you see it's also got FDA approved just several weeks ago. Um, again, a, a similar water plot where you see a response rate of 20%. And here you can see the best overall response, which contain, which includes confirmed and unconfirmed responses is 34%. So again, speaking to some of these lines in yellow, where you see some people with stable disease because they got a response and then it wasn't confirmed because they lost it by the next scan. And then similar data for the third generation covalently binding FGFR inhibitor, flutibatinib, here you see a response rate of 41.7%, a disease control rate of 82.5%. And again, you see some uh, light blue line, stable disease and um, yellow, yellow line, uh, progressive disease. So what's going on here? So overall, in summary, looking at these different drugs together, these are a series of different FGFR inhibitors that have specifically been in trials with patients with FGFR2 fusion or rearrangement cholangiocarcinoma in patients who had no prior FGFR inhibitor. And you can see the response rates are similar across the board, 20 to 40%. The median PFS also similar across the board, um, six months to nine months. And then uh, the median overall survival is a little bit variable across the different populations. So that's what we see for the current landscape. But where are we going next? Why are we seeing um, drug failure in these patients? So this is a favorite slide of mine from one of my mentors, Keith Flaherty uh, at Mass General, and it's the pyramid of vulnerabilities. And we know that different oncogenes and different tumor suppressors are differentially sensitive to uh, targeted therapies. And what we see is there are certain alterations that are in the top of the pyramid. And here you actually see a lot of fusions like ALK fusions, NTRAC, RET, ROS, and the response rates at the top of the period are, pyramid are often more than 50% and often 70%, 80%, and tumors that have these alterations are highly oncogene addicted. A lot of these are in lung cancer, but you also see in melanoma and GIST. And then there are middle of the pyramid vulnerabilities like PIK3CA, which you see in breast cancer a lot, and there was just an approval in, in breast cancer. HER2, where there's certain HER2 inhibitors are launching this um, alteration into the top of the pyramid. And then FGFR is squarely in the middle of the pyramid, the response rates in the 20 to 40% range. And then BRAF, you know, BRAF in colon is different than BRAF in melanoma. So the question is what makes certain alterations middle of the pyramid vulnerabilities and how can we overcome that? So I'm gonna to talk today about why FGFR is a middle of the pyramid vulnerability and then some of the next generation trials that we hope will launch FGFR into the top of the pyramid. So there are lots of different ways to think about reasons for drug failure. Uh, this is one way I think about it. Is it a target issue? Is it a tumor issue? Or is it a drug issue? So in terms of uh, target issue, I'll talk about all three of these. Is it because there are co-altered pathways? What are the most common co-mutations with FGFR? And is it partly that these tumor cells don't have strong oncogene addiction to FGFR, 
and there are some other pathways that are upregulated? Or is there feedback upregulation of compensatory mechanisms like we see in BRAF positive colon, where you need to be able to use dual targeting to be able to get over the resistance? So what are we seeing with co-altered pathways? This is some work by the team from uh, that developed Pemigatinib. And what we can see is that there is a high rate of patients who had tumor suppressor gene alterations and the patients who had tumor suppressor gene alterations concurrently with the FGFR2 fusions and rearrangements, they tended to have a um, PFS of 6.8 months. And this was statistically significant as a lower PFS than patients who had unaltered tumor suppressor genes. Um, specifically, they looked at this series of tumor suppressor genes and patients with CDKN2A or B loss, PBRM1 loss or alterations, and TP53. These are the different alterations that if you had this concurrently with FGFR, you tended to have a lower PFS. So there's ongoing work in the lab to understand why this could be the case, but this is certainly um, something that's worth noting. It's not a reason to not offer FGFR inhibitors to patients with co-alterations, but just something to think about that the patients may not get as much, uh, as much time on them. Then the team that develop, is developing Fudibatinib similarly presented these data at AACR. Um, what they showed actually was with TP53, um, the response rates were actually quite similar between patients who um, had TP53 co-alterations and not, and also the progression-free survival wasn't all that different. Now, these numbers are small, both in this study and the other one, only 13 patients had TP53 alterations. But here, it's good to know that there are certainly some patients that have responses. What we did see was the median PFS numerically was shorter in patients who had CDK, N2A, and B loss, um, similar to what we saw with pemigatinib, although response rates were similar in both groups. So one of the things that we were talking about is how do we work together to get large data sets to see what's happening on a larger scale? So with the help of ICRN and the Calangio Carcinoma Foundation, we've been able to collaborate with multiple fantastic uh, Calangio Carcinoma researchers across the country. We've all pooled our data together to understand what is the natural history of this disease and what are the co-alterations and how do they impact uh, response to FGFR inhibitors. And so in total, we've looked at 312 patients that have FGFR altered calangiocarcinoma, 288, which met eligibility, 226 that had FGFR2 fusions, truncations, or rearrangements, 62 that had FGFR2 mutations. And then we also looked at patients who had FGFR testing were negative for both fusions and mutations and were FGFR wild type. And those were 95 patients and we compared them. So first, in terms of co-alterations, what did we see? What we saw was CDKN2A. So here you have in green, the FGFR2 fusion population, in yellow, the FGFR wild type population, and in red, the FGFR, sorry, yellow is FGFR mutant, I apologize for that typo, and then red is FGFR wild type. And so what we see is CDKN2A co-alterations are not uncommon in the fusion and mutation population, but we don't see them as often in the wild type population. And so you can see that was statistically significant. You also see BAP1 alterations in CDKN2B are also quite common in the FGFR2 fusion population, although this was not statistically significant. On the other hand, we didn't see any co-alterations in KRAS in the FGFR2 fusion population, and we saw rare alterations in IDH1, although it was a non-zero number showing that probably you only need one oncogene to cause cancer. So it's not common to see two, um, well, you know, IDH1 is not an oncogene per se, but two pathways altered that are known to be drivers in cancer. And then in the uh, FGFR wild type population, we saw more HER2 alterations and more TP53 alterations than you see concurrently with FGFR2 fusions or FGFR2 mutants, mutant tumors. So overall, you know, with a large population, we're seeing something very similar to what's been reported before. And then how did this impact uh, responses to FGFR inhibitors? We looked at both responses to ATP competitive inhibitors and responses to covalent inhibitors. And when we looked at this population of 99 patients who got a variety of different ATP competitive inhibitors, we did not see a significant difference in the progression-free survival, uh, depending on what co-alteration you had. And also, if you had a tumor suppressor gene altered, there was a trend towards a difference in PFS, but it was not statistically significant. 
And then similarly with people who are on the covalent inhibitors, almost all uh, who are on fudibatinib, we also did not see a difference. So this is just sort of real world data. You know, a lot of these patients were on cl clinical trials, but when you put everything together, we're not seeing as much of a difference. Okay, now looking at tumor heterogeneity, we certainly been a lot of stories by many groups looking at acquired resistance. We know that tumor heterogeneity is a reason for failure, both to chemotherapy and to targeted therapy. What have we learned about the tumor heterogeneity in cholangiocarcinoma that could be driving uh, drug failure to FGFR inhibitors? So first, certainly acquired resistance is playing a role. You know, the first set of data were on primary resistance. This is around acquired resistance. And uh, these data have been out for a long time, but this basically shows that patients who were treated with infragratinib, we looked at three different patients who were treated with infragratinib. They all had FGFR2 fusion positive cholangiocarcinoma. And at baseline, they did not have any mutations in the kinase domain of FGFR2. And all three of these patients had significant tumor shrinkage. But then at progression, I give one patient as an example, this patient had only one mutation on post-progression tumor biopsy, but had five different mutations in the FGFR2 kinase domain um, on cell-free DNA, showing polyclonal secondary mutations in FGFR2. And other groups have shown this with pemigatinib and with other drugs. And uh, the reason for this failure is that, for example, when patients have alterations in the gatekeeper, um, the various drugs have difficulty binding to their usual binding site because uh, the gatekeeper mutation sterically hinders um, binding. And so that's often if you have valine going to phenylalanine because phenylalanine has a bulky side group. And then also some of the alterations are um, residues in the molecular break. And so when you have mutations in molecular break, altered, then you get disengagement of the molecular break, and then you have constitutive activation through this pathway. And this was elegant work done by Byron and colleagues back in 2013, before we ever saw this in the clinic. These are some of the mutations that were predicted on FGFR inhibitors ahead of time. And so what's going on with only seeing one mutation in the biopsy, but five mutations in the blood? Um, our team at MGH and also Dr. Roy Chaudhry's team at Ohio State um, have both put forward some studies on rapid autopsies. Our patients have generally generously donated their bodies and their families have gen generously donated their loved ones' bodies to try to learn um, even after a patient passes away and they've donated their body to science. And so this is a program at uh, different institutions where after someone passes away, within a couple of hours of them passing, we're able to do a tissue donation where the, an, a pathologist comes in and the oncology attending comes in, and we're able to sample multiple different lesions from throughout the body. So we can see what's going on in different metastases. And what we found was that in 12 different, muta 12 different metastases that were sampled, only four ended up harboring FGFR2 kinase domain mutations, but there were different mutations in different lesions showing that there's certainly a heterogeneity across different metastases leading to resistance. And you know that makes it challenging. Uh, and Dr. Roy Choudhury's group with Melanie Crook, who led this uh, project, also found something similar that only one in nine lesions of this patient who had a fusion positive phalangiocarcinoma was treated with pemigatinib, only one in nine lesions had a kinase domain mutation. And so um, what makes this challenging is when you're thinking of what to give as a next generation inhibitor, are we going to be able to overcome resistance in all the lesions, or are we going to end up seeing mixed responses where we only see responses in certain lesions while we see progression in other lesions? So really a clinical conundrum that we're trying to solve with the next generation of trials. And so another collaboration that has been facilitated by the Phalangiocarcinoma Foundation has been a landscape project looking at acquired resistance to FGFR inhibitors. Again, multiple fantastic phalangiocarcinoma researchers throughout the country have participated in this, um, in addition to uh, Antoine Hollebeck from uh, Gustav Roussi. And we've all collectively pooled our data because you know, many of us have two, three, four patients that have gone on FGFR inhibitors, and then we've done circulating tumor DNA analysis or post-progression biopsy to understand mechanisms of resistance. 
Now, these are some data that we presented at the triple meeting uh, at the end of last year. And so the inclusion criteria for this study were looking at patients with FGFR2 fusions or rearrangements um, who had advanced cholangiocarcinoma who were treated with a selective FGFR inhibitor on a clinical trial. And they had at least one post-progression tumor biopsy or ctDNA analysis after progression on their first FGFR inhibitor. And specifically, we excluded anyone who had intervening therapy between the first FGFR, between the progression on the FGFR inhibitor and um, the post-progression biopsy or um, ctDNA analysis. And in total, we had a 50 patients, 40 of six, 46 of which were eligible. And that included 20 who received a reversible FGFR inhibitor and 26 who received an irreversible FGFR inhibitor. And what we found interestingly was that there were two residues that were recurrently mutated in patients post-progression. One was the N550 residue and the other was the V565 residue. And as you recall, V565 is the gatekeeper residue and N550 is the molecular break residue. And what's really interesting is whether you went on a reversible inhibitor or an irreversible inhibitor, these are two mutations that popped up over and over again. And interestingly, in some preclinical work, um, it looked like fludibatinib, one of the main irreversible inhibitors that are uh, in development right now, was going to be able to overcome the N550 alterations, yet we're still seeing them in patients. The other very interesting alteration that we've really only seen in one patient and all the patients that we've treated with the covalent inhibitor is the, C4, the FGFR2 C492F mutation. Now, as we know, covalent inhibitors, they take advantage of binding to a cysteine residue in the ATP binding pocket of the FGFR2 kinase domain, kinase domain. And when we have other covalent inhibitors, for example, the EGFR inhibitor, osimertinib, one mechanism of resistance to osimertinib is a mutation in the cysteine residue to which osimertinib binds. And so people develop an EGFR C797S mutation. That's relatively, that's not uncommon. But C492F was uh, really very rarely seen, and I've only seen it in one patient in our entire landscape resistance project, only one patient had it. So that really behooves us to really understand the biology of this um, mutation. And it also shows that it may not be such a liability. And therefore, as we think about next generation FGFR inhibitors to develop, having drugs that bind to the cysteine residue um, may be an effective way to uh, overcome resistance to for example, these other mutations in these other residues. The other thing that we saw was some patients had monoclonal resistance, other patients had polyclonal resistance, and some patients had no FGFR2 mutations uh, detected. And there was a difference in the progression-free survival, whether people had monoclonal resistance or polyclonal resistance. Presumably, patients with polyclonal resistance had more heterogeneous tumors, and the PFS in these patients was 7.2 months. Um, of course, you know, lots of caveats of these data in that there are multiple different inhibitors um, uh, that we looked at and you know, many different institutions, but it is clinical trial data. So hopefully true PFS based on resist uh, criteria. Um, these are all preliminary data. You know, we're working on uh, putting this out for publication, but this is where we were back in November. Another interesting point was we saw convergence of resistance on specific residues. So yes, we saw alterations in N550 and V565, but we saw multiple different mutations at the N550 residue. As you can see, we have a mutation N550D, H, K, and T, and you can see the relative frequencies of these different alterations, whether someone was on that reversible and ir irreversible alteration. And similarly with V565, so it's, you know, multiple roads lead to the same place, lots of different ways to mutate these residues. So these are certainly major liabilities for the current FGFR inhibitors. And what we also saw is some patients had two different N550K mutations. So it was just, you know, with each amino acid, there are three different ways to get that, to that amino acid. So people had different base pair changes that had two different mutations in n 5 at, you know, that were N550K. And so again, showing a convergence of uh, resistance mechanisms and showing just how important these are as resistance mechanisms. And then it could also be that we're not seeing the response rates that we're looking for with the middle of the pyramid vulnerabilities because our drugs are not good enough. 
potentially it could be because we're not seeing enough potency or we're not seeing enough selectivity. And so how can we overcome this, uh, these two issues with the drugs? So first, in terms of potency, um, the covalently binding inhibitor, fudibatinib, that's the third generation inhibitor. We see single digit nanomolar, nanomolar IC50s for the FGFR wild type, for FGFR2 in particular. And that's similar to the second generation FGFR inhibitors as well. What's unique about fudibatinib is that it also has single digit nanomolar IC50s against the um, mutations in the FGFR2 kinase domain. And so overall, this drug is thought to potentially be able to overcome resistance to some of the ATP competitive inhibitors. And these are the data that we showed earlier. This is in the first line, sorry, not in the first line. This is an FGFR inhibitor naive patients. Um, so it's their first FGFR inhibitor. And we saw 42%. Uh, response right there. So based on the preclinical data, we thought to ourselves, well, a lot of people develop these um, acquired resistance mechanisms with the second generation ATP competitive inhibitors. What if we sequence inhibitors and give patients the covalent inhibitors after the second generation inhibitors? So this is a paper that was done two years ago, back when infragratinib was still called BGJ. And these are, a, this is a proof of concept study that our team did looking at four patients who had FGFR2 fusion positive plantar carcinoma. They all got a second generation ATP competitive inhibitor. They all had a response, a partial response. And then afterwards, a series of them had either ctDNA or tissue biopsy or both. And what we found was multiple patients developed mutations in the FGFR2 kinase domain. And so, all of these patients were treated with TAS120, that's what it was called back then, now fudibatinib. And as you can see, the progression-free survival on fudibatinib was somewhere between five and 17 months, and they all had stable disease or a response as their best response. And so overall, with this sequencing of FGFR inhibitors, we found that patients got one to two years, and even one patient got more than two years of benefit with the sequencing strategy. And so this was a proof of concept that we want to be thinking about third generation inhibitors and covalently binding inhibitors that could potentially overcome resistance to second generation inhibitors. So we want to think about sequential treatments to prolong the strategy of uh, FGFR inhibition. And so to understand this a little bit further, uh, working with Nabil Bardisi, we looked at the ability of each of these different FGFR inhibitors that were given to patients in this study. Uh, and looking at their ability to overcome each of the different mutations that were found in this study. And we found that infragratinib was able to overcome a portion of the uh, alterations. Debio1347 was also able to overcome a portion of these alterations, and specifically um, the gatekeeper alteration, V565F. It had reasonable potency against the gatekeeper. And then fudibatinib was least affected by these eight different alterations, but we did see that um, it was affected more significantly by the gatekeeper alteration. And other groups have also looked at this, looking at what are the different FGFR alterations that we see and what are the different FGFR inhibitors' ability to overcome um, resistance based on these different alterations. And overall, the message from all of these studies is that different FGFR inhibitors have different spectrums of activity. And we want to understand which uh, FGFR inhibitors are specifically potentially beneficial against certain alterations. And doing serial CTDNA, CTDNA analysis and biopsies can help us understand what are the resistance mechanisms and how should we sequence these FGFR inhibitors. And the next generation inhibitors, a key um, important thing for all of them will be to see how well they have potency against some of the more common uh, FGFR2 kinase mutations that arise on other FGFR inhibitors. And so this phenomenon is not only being seen in FGFR2 fusion positive phalangeal carcinoma, it's also being seen in um, this group of patients that have extracellular domain in frame deletions um, in uh, FGFR2. So this is what I was talking about earlier, and this elegant work by James Cleary and uh, the team at Dana-Farber in collaboration with our team at Mass General, 
And what we found was, so here's a patient who was 48 years old at initial diagnosis. She was found to have this FGFR2, H167 and 173 deletion. And she enrolled on a trial of WO1347. And she had a tumor reduction of 51%. And she was able to remain on WO1347 for 13 months. <coughs> so this reflects the importance of when you're doing the initial studies with these different drugs, to have a broad catchment, you know, you might have a hunch that one population of patients might respond the best, but when you allow patients with different FGFR alterations to enter a trial, you can also do some discovery of biology um, in the clinic, even before that biology is assessed in the lab. And that's what happened here, where this patient luckily was able to get more than a year on W1347. Unfortunately, uh, after 13 months, she developed progression and biopsy showed uh, FGFR2 L618F mutation. And then this is work by the Bardisi lab showing that this mutation uh, does cause resistance to FGFR inhibitors and indeed fudibatinib, excuse me, overcomes resistance to this different, to this mutation. And so this all, all just goes to show that whether someone has an FGFR2 fusion or an in-frame deletion, um, it's worth, and especially if someone has a response or prolonged benefit and shows evidence of oncogenic addiction to the FGFR pathway, it's worth taking a look at what kind of acquired resistance mechanisms do people develop. Um, as I showed in the landscape project, there's certainly people who progress who don't develop FGFR kinase domain mutations. So as we get smarter over time, hopefully we can figure out both FGFR and non-FGFR mechanisms of resistance. And then going back to the second point about maybe our drugs aren't good enough, part of it is potentially they're not selective enough. Currently, most of the drugs that are in development are pan-FGFR inhibitors, and they inhibit FGFR 1 through 3, and some of them, like fudibatinib, inhibit 1 through 4. And what's the liability of inhibiting FGFR 1? What you see is people end up getting hyperphosphatemia because you disrupt the interaction of the ligand FGF23 with uh, FGFR1 in the kidneys, and patients are not able to spill uh, phosphorus in their urine. And so one way around this would be to develop an FGFR2-specific inhibitor, because what happens with the hyperphosphatemia is, you know, sometimes patients have to go on low phosphorus diets to avoid this phosphorus going too high and the risk of the phosphorus and the calcium um, binding and leading to crystallization. The truth is, as we've gained more experience with these drugs, we're actually much more permissive of hyperphosphatemia because this um, calciphylaxis and uh, kidney stones and other forms of calcium phosphate crystals are not that common. And so even if someone has a phosphorus greater than seven, we're often permitting them to stay on uh, full dose of the drug, but just making sure that we're aggressive with the phosphorus binders. But those drugs can cause constipation and nausea. So being able to develop FGFR2 specific inhibitors would certainly be a boon for our patients. Uh, so we talked about the first, we talked about what leads to drug failure. So now let's talk about the pipeline and what are some of the next generation trials. So I will basically talk about four different trials. One that's currently ongoing, two that we hope to um, open, and then uh, a fourth one that is actually a trial in gastric cancer that was just presented at ASCO and thinking about whether it's worth looking at that molecule in glangiocarcinoma. <coughs> so there are a variety of different FGFR inhibitor trials that are ongoing, but I just wanted to highlight one based on what I just talked about with the hyper phosphatemia being an issue. This is the first and only selective small molecule inhibitor of FGFR2 in clinical development. It's a drug called RLY4008. It's a first in human trial that's currently ongoing. It's in dose escalation in patients with unresectable intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma and other advanced solid tumors. Patients can have FGFR2 fusions, amplifications, or mutations that are on that are thought to be oncogenic. And in the dose expansion, it's going to include patients with intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma who had a prior FGFR inhibitor or who didn't have a prior FGFR inhibitor, and then a series of other groups, as you can see here. The preclinical data for this drug um, are impressive, and I'm gonna show you that next. So one, the selectivity 
for FGFR2 over FGFR1 is greater than 200 fold in the biochemical cellular assays. Um, and you don't see as much of a difference with pemigatinib, infragratinib, and TAS120. Um, what you see is tumor regression, significant tumor regression with this drug in vivo. And then when you look at hyperphosphatemia, you're seeing the hyperphosphatemia with other drugs such as Fudibatinib or TAS120, but you're not really seeing um, significant hyperphosphatemia with the relay drug. Um, and similar, it's similar to what you see with vehicle. And so if we can overcome this liability for patients, that's certainly a step in the right direction. And then in terms of the other preclinical data, how well does it do against the FGFR2 resistance mutations? This is a heat map showing the activity of the RLY4008 drug compared to some of the other drugs that are in development currently um, or FDA approved against a series of different alterations, which we've shown um, commonly develop in patients who are treated with the different FGFR inhibitors. And red means the drug um, is significantly affected by this alteration and is not able to overcome it very well. Green means it has good activity against the alteration. Of course, this is all preclinical in models. So what will happen in patients is yet to be seen, but the preclinical data for the RLY4008 drug show that it certainly does have significant activity against many of the liabilities that we are seeing on the other FGFR inhibitors. Um, and then you can also see in a xenograft model here that um, with the RLY4008 drug in a model that has FGFR2 and 550K, um, you see regression here, but with pemigatinib, you do not see regression. And here's some public data that the company has put out. Um, a second trial that um, I want to talk about is the common control arm trial. So our different FGFR inhibitor trials that are currently ongoing. These are all phase three trials because as we know, pemigatinib has gotten approved, infragratinib has gotten approved, and fudibatinib has breakthrough designation. So we hope this will also eventually um, get approved. But these three trials, or to get full approval, are going up against gemcitabine and cisplatin in patients with FGFR2 fusion positive cholangiocarcinoma. And as you can see, they're trying to enroll 400 plus, 300 plus, and 200 plus patients, and they all have a common control arm, gemcitabine, cisplatin. Um, and because these patients um, are, it's not a very common group of patients, people have FGFR2 fusion positive cholangiocarcinoma. Um, and because it's in the first line and we need to basically have time to assess what is the mutational landscape of a patient's tumor, um, these, patient, these trials have not accrued as quickly as we have wanted them to accrue. And they're gonna take many, many years to each lead, uh, complete accrual. So very much with the advocacy of the Cholangiocarcinoma Foundation and people like Melinda and Stacy, and then also a lot of the uh, investigators like um, Milan Javle, Mithesh Borat, Ghassan Abu Alpha. There's conversation with the companies and with the FDA to actually bring all these three trials together into what's called the common control arm study. And we're hoping that this will be a phase three frontline study. You know, conversations about this are still ongoing where three arms are gonna be pemigatinib, infragratinib, and fudibatinib, and the fourth arm is gonna be gemcitabine plus cisplatin. So we hope that this will get off the ground to be able to help our patients. And then one more trial that I wanted to share is a trial that we hope to be opening at Mass General. So this is based on data from some of the models that we have developed in, in collaboration with Nabil Bardisi. So through the uh, combination of surgical samples, biopsy samples, and the rapid autopsy program, uh, Dr. Bardisi has been able to develop a series of different FGFR positive models. And in those models, we basically did a high throughput drug screen to see what drugs could combine with FGFR inhibitors to lead to synergy and significant tumor regression and what were, or significant tumor kill. And what we found was the EGFR inhibitors um, were the ones that led to uh, synergy with the FGFR inhibitors. And so uh, the, based on these data, we applied to um, a pharmaceutical company for the 
for funding to support an investigator initiated trial of pemigatinib plus afatinib. And this is going to be a dose escalation study at first in all FGFR altered solid tumors. And then we're gonna to move to a dose expansion trial, um, which is gonna be this combination in FGFR inhibitor naive and also FGFR inhibitor pretreated, um, FGFR altered cholangiocarcinoma. And then if we see a signal in the phase 1A portion in a certain population, for example, in urothelial cancer or another cancer, um, we're hoping to potentially even be able to open a third cohort um, based on signals that we see in the first cohort. And for this trial, it's going to be the pemigatinib is going to be the anchor drug, and it's going to be a combination with a fatinib. So pemigatinib will be at full dose, 13.5 milligrams, two weeks on, one week off. A fatinib will be in dose escalation and see what is tolerated. And the usual um, primary and secondary objectives for phase one trials. And then we really hope to do some translational work to understand uh, what's going on with the crosstalk between the FGFR and EGFR pathway and with some Ontrian biopsies, seeing if we're able to shut down uh, FGFR signaling. The last trial that I wanted to talk about is actually a trial in gastric cancer. And this was just presented at ASCO by Dan Katnachi on behalf of the fight investigators. And this is a unique drug called bemerituzumab. So this is an FGFR 2B antibody, and it's uh, an IgG1 specific antibody against the FGFR 2B receptor. And so one of the benefits of this drug is that it's also FGFR1 sparing, so it does not lead to the hyperphosphatemia. And it has an additional mechanism of enhancing ADCC, antibody dependence cytotoxic um, cell kill basically. And so what's, what happened with this uh, drug? This was the phase two fight study, and this was in patients with no prior therapy for unresectable or locally advanced metastatic gastric or GE junction adenocarcinoma. They all either had to have FGFR2B overexpression or FGFR2 gene amplification by ctDNA, and they were, uh, could not have been known to be HER2 positive. The stratification factors were by geographic region, single dose of Fulfox while it's screening, and prior perioperative chemotherapy. This single dose of Fulfox is really important. Nearly 50% of patients actually had one dose of Fulfox while they were waiting for their biomarker screening. And this is something that might, is also being considered in the common control arm study, that people can get one dose of GEMSYS while they're waiting for their FGFR2 fusion results to come back. This certainly allows patients to get started on therapy. Um, while they're waiting, which is really important for patients and for oncologists treating them. Um, in this trial, patients were randomized in a one-to-one -one fashion to bemerituzumab or placebo, and the primary endpoint was PFS, um, secondary endpoint was OS. So interestingly, in this study, again, they looked at FGFR2B overexpression by um, IHC, and it was defined as 2 plus or 3 plus staining, and they had a second biomarker, FGFR gene amplification by ctDNA. So the question is, is there FGFR2B overexpression in cholangiocarcinoma? So in this study, it was a positive study. Um, it was positive for the PFS, which was presented at GI ASCO uh, earlier this year um, by Zev Weinberg. And then this was presented, the overall survival, you can see that there was a, a 5.7 month improvement in overall survival in the patients who were treated with full FOX plus bemerituzumab compared to full FOX plus placebo. And then specifically in the patients who had at least 10% of their cells positive for FGFR2 expression, you saw an even greater spread of 25 month overall, median overall survival compared to 11 months. And so it looks like a viable biomarker. And that's impressive because protein expression oftentimes has not been a successful biomarker in oncology, um, like for example, med expression. So this is something to think about. And when you look at Bema or Tuzumab compared to the other FDA approved drugs, you can see that you do not see a lot of um, hyperphosphatemia, there's none reported, and you also do not see retinal toxicity, but you did, we did see a fair amount of corneal toxicity, um, some of which can potentially be uh, managed prophylactically. Um, so this is something that, you know, is there FGFR2 expression in cholangiocarcinoma? This is some unpublished work from our team where we used FGFR2-ish, and what you see here is the population here is the FGFR2 negative population, and here is the FGFR2 positive population. This was done on a series of TMAs in collaboration with Mayo Clinic. 
And what we found was um, even among patients who do not have FGFR2 fusion positive status, um, a fair number of them have FGFR2 or 3 positive FGFR2 expression. Now, this wasn't specifically looking for FGFR2B expression, so we didn't need to you know, specifically have the antibody for that and look for that, but something to consider in cholangiocarcinoma if this ends up being a viable biomarker. So it's really just about pushing the limits and thinking more creatively beyond FGFR2 fusions to, for example, looking at the in-frame deletions, maybe looking at IHC expression of FGFR2B and seeing what other patients could we be missing that could benefit from this strategy. So in closing, FGFR resistance is something that um, is a problem in FGFR-positive cholangiocarcinoma, but something that we're certainly getting a handle on with uh, collaboration across many different teams and uh, serial biopsies and ctDNA sampling in patients with FGFR inhibitors is critical to understanding the mechanisms. And luckily, this is being built into a lot of FGFR inhibitor trials now. And that understanding resistance can lead to rational sequencing of FGFR inhibitors. So patients could potentially get longer out of the strategy of targeting the Achilles heel in their tumor. And then two residues that uh, are often mutated that are a liability for the current FGFR inhibitors are the gatekeeper residue and also one of the molecular break residues. And so current pharmaceutical companies are working on addressing these residues with their new molecules. And then finally, there's significant hope in FGFR positive cholangiocarcinoma, their next generation FGFR inhibitors, combination strategies, and potentially new FGFR biomarkers that are under investigation in advanced solid tumors and also in cholangiocarcinoma. And we look forward to the results of these studies to move this field forward. Thank you very much to all the patients and their families Really, we cannot do this research without your generous donation of your time to join clinics and your bravery to join uh, clinical trials, and also your willingness to provide your data and consent to research protocols, um, tissue, blood. Um, it's really, this is a real partnership between patients and investigators to learn more about how to develop new drugs in this field. Of course, all the research personnel and the many, many collaborators across many institutions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Goyle. That was a tour de force of um, FGFR and cholangiocarcinoma. Um, I have a, a couple of questions I'd love to ask you and anybody who has any questions, please put them into the chat box and we're happy to ask for you as well. Um, so the, the first question I'd love to ask is about resistance and stopping and starting therapy. So as you know, many of these patients, especially for their derm toxicity, we end up having to stop and start. And what impact do you think that that has and how much should we be trying not to stop and start when it comes to the development and emergence of resistance? You know, that's a fantastic question, you know, and one that's yet to be answered. I would say, as you know, for infragratinib and pemigatinib, those drugs were three weeks on, one week off, and two weeks on, one week off. So they had a built-in one week off time period to allow for the metabolites that built up that were causing hyperphosphatemia and some of the toxicity for those to clear. Um, and they had you know, similar response rates and progression-free survivals to what you see with Fudibatinib, which was given on a continuous schedule with no breaks. But in all three of these drugs, there were certain trials, there were certainly patients that had to stop. Um, hopefully with the next generation of inhibitors, we'll be able to one, overcome the issue of the hyperphosphatemia, so we will not have drug holds and stops for that. I know the Fudibatinib team at AACR presented data showing that even in the patients that had drug holds and dose reductions um, for a variety of different reasons, the response rate in that population was still close to 41%, it was around 40%. And so luckily it ended up not being a major liability for those patients. Um, but, you know, if we're stopping drug, it also means that the patient is not tolerating it. So as we get better at being able to design drugs that are better tolerated, I think it'll be better for people's quality of life as well. And the, so the FGFR2 specific agents, what would we predict about the derms toxicities there? Just because it, it, you, I think you made an excellent case for the fact that the phosphatemia is often a lab value and not clinically meaningful, um, although it makes us nervous, whereas the derm toxicities often end up being causes for patient quality of life. So what would we Absolutely. expect with you know, the RY agent, for example? Yeah, you know, to be honest, I don't know that we know exactly when people get 
the hand foot syndrome, when they get mucositis, when they get retinal toxicity, when they get dry eyes or dry mouth, when they get some of these different FGFR related toxicities. I don't know that we necessarily know if this is driven by FGFR1, FGFR2, or FGFR3. I think it'll be really helpful to see what the safety data are from the relay drug to hopefully better understand, are these mediated by FGFR2 or not? You know, what was interesting in the bemertuzumab study was they really didn't see um, retinal toxicity. And, you know, whether that's because it's a monoclonal antibody and it's too large to cross the retinal brain barrier, or because retinal toxicity is not um, mediated by FGFR2B, but I think it's a really good point that as we see the safety data from the relay drug, we will better understand um, where some of these toxicities are coming from if they're mediated by FGFR2. Okay, and just finally, since I have you, um, tell me why, based on your preliminary data, you we would have expected the WO agent would actually be a great drug, and instead it ended up looking like potentially it's not as clinically, or at least they're not moving forward the same way as some of these other agents. You have any theories? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, we were we definitely had high hopes for that drug, and there were certainly some patients with FGFR2 fusion cholangiocarcinoma, FGFR2 in-frame deletion positive cholangiocarcinoma, who got greater than a year on that drug. And also it has more activity against the gatekeeper relatively compared to some of the other mutations. So we were really hopeful for that drug. To be honest, I think that we don't fully know if it was a dose issue or uh, a toxicity issue or some other issue. I think, you know, the publication for the WO study is still forthcoming for the FUSE trial, which was, as you know, was ended early. So hopefully the team will be able to give us some more insight into what could be, could have caused drug failure. Yeah, I think it's going to be really interesting. Two, my, my two patients that have had the longest period of time on an FGFR inhibitor were also on that study. So it, I just, it, you know, but of course, that, that's what's the difference between anecdotes of two and an entire trial. So, right, well, right. Thank you so much. Um, this has been fantastic. And we're going to wish you and everybody else a wonderful weekend and a wonderful summer. Thank you so much, Neela. Thank you for having me. Bye bye. Bye bye.